So when they were finally brought before the courts, they were in leg irons, they were in handcuffs, they were like Osama bin Laden. <laughs> they were really like, uh, yeah. So it, it really looked like, it really looked scary and really bad. But they were also looking very, uh, no, they were not looking very good from the beatings and the everything. So they finally explained to the court how they were coerced into signing their confessions. Sibanda even said in his statement that he has bite marks on his hand when Kala beat him when he was trying to kidnap him. So according to Sibanda, when he was kidnapping Kala, when he was part of the people that were kidnapping Nkala, Nkala actually uh, like uh, beat his hand and so he had marks of teeth on his hand. But a medical doctor who examined him said those marks could not have been from teeth. They actually came from some sharp object. They couldn't be teeth. So he said he was coerced into saying that those were teeth marks, but they were not. Hello everyone, welcome to yet another edition of Real Crimes with me. So in this channel, we basically talk about real crimes, mysteries and murders that have happened in Zimbabwe, outside Zimbabwe and anywhere and everywhere where Africans are thriving. But most of my stories are actually from Zimbabwe. So I talk about crimes. I talk about mysteries. I talk about murders, murders that have not been solved, murders that have been solved, crimes that have not been solved, crimes that have been solved. And obviously mysteries that involve um, probably witchcraft, probably unexplainable things, yeah? Just to file a disclaimer, guys, everything that I talk about on this channel is not of my own making. I do not make up stories. I love telling them, but I don't make them up. Everything that I say on this channel is already in the public domain. So I basically look around for these stories and then I come up with a video. I don't make up stories. That's my disclaimer right there. Um, so if you're new to this channel, welcome. And thank you for stopping by. Please don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like, to share. Tell a friend to tell a friend and let's grow the family. If you are a subscriber already, thank you for coming back and thank you for your support. I totally do appreciate. So in today's story, I am going to talk about uh, murder, mystery, and crime it's a three in one it's a crime and it was a murder and it remains a mystery because this murder has not been solved so it is a mystery right so the person I'm gonna talk about today today we actually in Bulawayo yet again so we are in Bulawayo in Zimbabwe that is the second largest city of Zimbabwe and I'm going to talk about the chairperson of the war vet, Comrade Kane Gala, okay, who lived from 1958 to 2001. So Comrade Kane Gala was born in 1958 in Gwanda, and he grew up there. He did his primary education as well as secondary education in Gwanda. After receiving his secondary qualifications, he got a certificate in metal work and agriculture before he moved to Bulawayo, to the city, to join his family. So while he was, not to join his family, but to join his parents rather. So he joined his parents in the city of Bulawayo. And while he was also in Bulawayo, he joined what is called, what was called the Inyati Youth uh, Club in Mpopoma. I don't know if it's still there, guys. If it's still there, uh, yeah. He was actually once a member of that club. He also worked for G and D um, shoes as a machine operator. So he did work for a shoe company. So in 1977, he was now a youth, right? So in 1977, um, the late Joshua Mkabu Konyongo Longomo addressed some youths in Popoma at uh, 
Maho, a shopping center. And he was obviously talking about what was going on at that time, the, the liberation struggle and everything. So Kane Gala and some friends, other youths his age, they actually loved what Nkomo was saying and they fell in love with what, what he was saying and they really wanted to be a part of this thing. So they decided that they were going to leave the country and join the liberation struggle, which they did. They went to Zambia through Botswana. So in Zambia, they were received well and they got training. They were trained on all the basic uh, military stuff. And Kane Komo, for some reason, I'm sure he had superb leadership uh, qualities because he was rising through the ranks and he was being put in charge of these groups and everything. He was even one of the first people that were trained by the Cubans in Angola. So he got training through some Cubans that came through uh, to Angola to train them. And he was just rising through the ranks. And eventually when he was done with all his training and he was ready to be deployed, he was deployed to Kariba, which is where he was now operating from during the liberation struggle. And after, uh, when Zimbabwe eventually gained independence, Comrade Ngala came back home as a lieutenant. Yeah. He was in the military. He was a military man and he was a lieutenant and he was obviously um, continuing his work for the uh, Zimbabwe National Army. But it is said that from 1983 to 1984, Comrade Ngala worked as a temporary teacher in the Ministry of Education. Now, why would somebody actually leave the army life that they know to become a temporary teacher? Especially during that time, this is 1983 to 1984, I'm sure the army was well kept, right? They were taken good care of because these are the people that had literally um, helped in liberating the country. So they were well taken care of. But from a bit of research that I did, it is said that he left the army because there was a scandal that he was involved in and he was arrested okay and that it, it was it was not a good thing so he had to leave the army and become a temporary teacher but yeah that is comrade kane gala <sighs> that's basically his history from birth to the time he was out of the military. So when the war veterans formed their organization, uh, which is called the Zimbabwe National uh, Liberation War Veterans Association, uh, Comrade Ngala obviously, uh, you know, jumped onto the wagon. He joined the, the organization. And in 1998, he was elected chairman for Bulawayo province for that organization. And during that time, uh, the t his tenure, he, he organized some very powerful demonstrations to do with the land. And he was determined to let, um, to make sure that people got back their land. Um, and also he, because of his position, he was described as somebody who was really determined to get the land from the white settlers as well as to uh, redistribute it to the black majority. And because of his position, uh, most people actually respected him, like most war veterans respected him because they all believed that's what that was the reason they went to war. So because he stood so firmly about it, he was re-elected to that same position of chairman in the year 2001. So by the time of um, his death, he didn't only, he wasn't only a chairperson of uh, the war veterans, uh, the Zimbabwe National Liberation War Veterans Association. He was also uh, um, an executive, in executive member in the ZANU-PF um committee in Matebeleland or in, no, no not in Matebeleland but in Ulawayo. So he held those two positions and he was believed to be he was said to be a very uh, loyal cadre as well as a firm believer in uh the reposition um the repositioning of the land and its redistribution 
to the black majority. Comrade Kane Gala, 1958 to 2001. So what then happened to Comrade Kane Gala? So remember, if you watched some of my um, my videos before, you would have seen that there is a video that I did about Patrick Navanyama, who was um, abducted and never seen. Right, Ken Kala was actually arrested in connection to that abduction, in connection with that ab abduction, brother. Ken Kala was one of the people that were said to have abducted and beaten up uh, Patrick. So that is something that dented his image. But what happened to Ken Kala? On the 5th of November, 2001, Ken Kala was abducted from his own home by 10 men. Now, this is the 5th of November, right? So from the 11th of November to the 13th of November, a lot of people were arrested, including the late Remember Moyo, including um, some guy called Sibanda. I actually, I'm actually made to understand that a total of 14 people were arrested in connection with um, the abduction of uh, Kane Gala. But what happened that was even, that is, totally mysterious was that on the 13th of November 2001, Kane Gala's body was recovered or it was exhumed from um, some shallow grave near Solus University. And right, that was done right in the full view of the cameras. Of the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation, a state-run um, broadcasting house. So they were right there, and they broadcasted everything. And after they broadcasted every, after they captured everything about the exhuming, they also went on to broadcast confessions, confessions that were done by the people that had been arrested. Remember Moyo, Sivan, Dampofu, you know, all those guys that had been arrested. There were some three statements that. Um, were recorded and these guys were confessing that they killed Kane Gala. They actually said they used shoelaces. Apparently he was actually strangled using his own shoelaces. So they did uh, confess this, okay? And everything was broadcasted on national television. Hmm. Yes. So obviously, you know, that was like put in the public of, in the court of public opinion, like they were judged, they were, they were sentenced by the public before they even got to the court. So anyway, uh, remember, um, and his, his colleagues were kept in custody for some time and eventually, uh, they came to court, but before they did, Nkala was laid to rest. He was declared a national hero and buried at the national shrine. Of And the speeches that were delivered at the national shrine, uh, they spoke like strongly against what happened to Nkala, which is justifiable, actually. It was only justifiable to speak strongly against it because there is no way that anybody would um, justify kidnapping somebody and killing them. That, that was very unjustifiable, okay? It was not right. So yeah, they made um, the people that delivered speeches, including the late and former president of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, they made strong statements. They made strong accusations towards the opposition MDC. They made strong, and they, they, they made a lot of noise about it. Uh, they tried very much to send the message out there to the international community and everything so that, oops, so that everybody knows what has happened. And that is just perfect. That is actually the way it should be. When such a thing happens, we really need to, you know, make people hear about it. People need to talk about it. We cannot sweep it under the carpet. So after Ken Gala's body was exhumed on the 13th of um, November 2001, on the 15th, um, rather on the 16th of November, 
the war veterans and ZANU-PF supporters in Bulawayo organized a march that had a police escort. So they are said to have marched in the city, demonstrating and um, singing against the killing of Kane Gala. And they actually went to the city wall. They said to be, um, they were armed with, you know, any weapons you can think of, shambox, um, catapults. <laughs> So they were said to be armed and then they were beating up people along the way, smashing windscreens for people that were just parked by. And if they just felt like you're looking at them in the wrong way, they'll just beat you up. So they say to have gone to uh, the city hall. They, have, they, are, they were said to have attacked the mayor, who was obviously an MDC person. And also the whole time they were under the watchful eye of the police who did not restrain them. They went on to burn the MDC offices. One witness said that she saw the she saw somebody taking a 20 liter plastic container out of a police vehicle and took it into the offices. The next thing, boom, the offices were on fire. Okay, the whole time they were being uh, escorted by the police. Now, I don't know if I should say they were being protected or they were being escorted. They were being escorted by the police. Okay, so they even um, decided that they would go to Zideco and do all this vandalizing of things and everything because they were not happy that um, Kane Kala had been killed. And yeah, true. That was not a happy event. So anyway, Ken Gala was not well known by many people, but he was known after he had passed on. That's when a lot of people got to know that there's this a man, the chairman uh, of the war vets, and he's called Ken Gala. So what happened when Remember Moyo and the others? Well, I understand Remember Moyo then passed on, right? He is said to have uh, left for South Africa while he was on bail. He and his friend left the country because they feared for their own lives. So they left the country and went to South Africa. But then remember Moyo is said to have passed on in South Africa uh, some, probably some years later, he passed on in South Africa. So those that went before the courts were, however, acquitted. Right. This this case dragged on and on and on. It, remember this thing happened in 2001. But in 2003, this case was discharged. The people were acquitted because the judge said that there was no evidence linking them to the murder. Not only that, but the accused, they stood in the court and explained how they were coerced into confessing those confessions that they gave they spoke about how they were beaten up how they were threatened with guns how they were threatened with um, disappearance and how they were made to sign those confessions they were also they also spoke about how they were tortured like their private parts and um yeah even they said uh, when they were arrested they were not told why they were being arrested so their rights were not read to them they were just taken and then they were being told later that this is what you guys did and you need to confess and you need to implicate a b c d so when they were finally brought before the courts they were in leg irons they were in handcuffs they were like osama bin laden <laughs> they were really like a uh, yeah so it, it really looked like it really looked scary and really bad but they were also looking very uh no, they were not looking very good from the beatings and the everything so they finally explained to the court how they were coerced into signing their confessions sibanda even said in his statement that he has bite marks on his hand when kala beat him when he was trying to kidnap him so according to sibanda when he was kidnapping kala when he was part of the people that were kidnapping Nkala, Nkala actually uh 
like uh beat his hand and so he had marks of teeth on his hand but a medical doctor who examined him said those marks could not have been from teeth they actually came from some sharp object they couldn't be teeth so he said he was coerced into saying that those were teeth marks but they were not so there were a lot of irregularities or a lot of uh, unexplained things in their statements and most of these things they were saying that they had been told to say that they said they were literally told what to say okay and uh they did exactly that because they had been uh beaten up they had been tortured they had been um you know a lot of stuff had been done to them okay now they at this point because their statements had been broadcasted on national tv and also their the exhumation had been broadcasted on national tv these guys were left at the mercy of the courts people felt that they had already been tried by the the court of public opinion and they felt that there was very little chance that they were going to win this in the courts because already people had made a judgment so it was now up to the defense team to prove innocence so in the way this thing was done according to some scholars it was that they had been uh, found guilty until proven innocent by the defense team so it was no longer up to the court to prove uh, guilty beyond reasonable doubt but it was now up to the defense to prove innocent beyond reasonable doubt that's how this case is said to have played out and fortunately for the defense they were able to do that because at the end these guys were uh, they were acquitted and their charges were all dropped Right. So these guys were acquitted. While the acquittal is actually a welcome development, right? It's a totally, totally welcome development because nobody should go down for a crime that they didn't do. I think we, we all agree on that. But that does not answer the question. What happened to Ken Gala? Who abducted him? Who killed him? And why? Now there are speculations. Okay, first of all, before I talk about the speculations, let me just um, highlight what uh, David Colt had said about the judgment. He said, open court. The judgment brings us back to the question, who killed Cain Gala? The judgment is a serious indictment on, of Sanupiev. The acting attorney general should immediately investigate the murder of Ngala and I suggest he starts close to home, close court. That was David Coltat. Sorry about that. Whew. That was a knock and a half and knocking on the wrong door. How disrespectful. Anyway, let's get back to our story. So the question still remains what happened to Cain Gala, who abducted him, who killed him and why. So the speculations that were actually being said, were, there is one that seems to be said a lot or that seemed to be said a lot during that time. I'm not sure if people are still saying it, but back then people used to say Cain Gala felt that his comrades were used as scapegoats in the abduction of uh, Patrick. Remember our Patrick? Don't forget Papa Uba Patrick. Don't forget Uba Patrick. So he felt that they were used as scapegoats and he was not happy. So he was about to speak. He was about to speak the whole truth about what happened to Patrick and who exactly was involved. And the people that were involved were said to be big people. I mean, big political figures. I mean, political fathers. Okay? So it is believed that they 
killed their own. It was a faction within the party that killed him because he was about to snitch and they were not having it. Because to date, nobody has been convicted for the abduction and killing of Cain Gala. But Cain Gala was abducted and Cain Gala was killed. Who could have done it? So the people that did it are walking scot-free. They are roaming the streets with nothing to worry about. That's just so sad. That is totally, totally sad. Yes, we might say, but guys, nobody deserves to be killed like that. It's not right. But anyway, it happened. Kane Gala, 1958 to 2001. So by the time he died, actually, he survived by his wife and five children. And he was uh, the chairperson of the Zimbabwe uh, Liberation War Hero War Veterans Association, uh, Blawayo Province, as well as a committee member of the ZANU PF um, Executive Committee in Bulawayo. Hmm. What happened to him? Who killed him? Why? Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. That's the story of the day. I hope you guys did enjoy this one. Guys, please do comment down below what you think. I honestly love to hear what you guys think, especially when we have such stories that are sensitive and that are mysterious and where people have lost their lives and nobody has gone, is, is actually uh, paid for it, you know? Of course, we can never pay enough to get a life or, yeah. But that's, I honestly feel like I just want to hear what you guys think. What do you guys think? First and foremost, I want to hear what you guys think about Kane Gala leaving the army to go and be a temporary teacher. What do you think could have happened? Why did he do that? Secondly, I want you to tell me what you guys think happened to Kane Gala. Or what have you heard about who killed Kane Gala and why? What, 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 what were people saying in your hood as you were growing up? Because that thing happened when I was also growing up. I wasn't growing up. I was grown, but not very grown. So what were people in your area saying? Because I remember seeing those images on, on ZBC. Back then, there wasn't much of DSTV. There wasn't much of multi-choice. There wasn't much of smart TVs. We used to watch ZBC and we used to sit and wait for the 8 o'clock news, the main news of the day. That's where those things were broadcasted. That I remember very, very well. What did people in your neighborhood say? What did people in your family say? In school, what were people saying? In college, what were people saying about this? Do comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, guys. <sighs> I do care about you. Do take care of yourselves. Do take care of your families. Do what you need to do to protect yourselves and your families. And stay away from crime. Because if you do crime, you are most likely to do the time. Unless you're a king, gala killer. Okay? Be blessed. Be safe. Goodbye for now.